Welcome to the Back Porch, everybody. I'm your host, Brandon Booth. You're at the Signpost In podcast, and I have with me today my co-host, Matt Boland. Hey, Matt. It's good to see you. Hey, Brandon. Great to see you, too. Listeners, we have decided today to talk about an article by Henry Nowen. Uh, the article is titled, From Solitude to Community to Ministry. And it's a short little article. We'll put links to it in the show note. You can actually get it for free just about anywhere online these days. And it has a lot to say about spiritual disciplines and specifically solitude, community, and ministry. And so we thought, thought, thought that was really relevant to what we're doing and to what you guys are doing. So I hope you enjoy the conversation. Before we do that, however, we have a couple announcements to make, and we have to give our updates from the back porch. So, um, first of all, one announcement. Uh, by the time this episode airs, we should be well into the fall, uh, and that should mean that Leave and I's new book is printed and available, and you can go to the website and purchase it, signpostin.org. That's the plan. Hopefully when you're listening to this, that's actually true and you can just buy it. The book is actually in the hands of a copy editor, going to be printed really, really soon. And unless our copy editor finds some sort of glaring error that we need to rewrite five chapters, which I don't think will happen, then we are going to be on track to start publishing in August. What we're going to do is we're going to send out all the stuff to the donors first people who um, have supported us get a copy first and then we'll make it available. If you've hopefully maybe even already got your copy, maybe that's what's happening while you're listening to this. That'd be awesome. The book is called Not Home Yet, How to Be Human in an Inhuman World. And it's a two-parter. The first part is to welcome people who are lonely and weary and feeling like this world is not their home, which to be honest, I think is everybody. <laughs> and then the second part of the book, that first part, helps you to find solace, find friendship in Christ, that he is a home for the homeless, so to speak, and to really connect with him first. And then the second part of the book is all about hospitality, how to create that kind of connection for others, how to help others find that same connection with Jesus through the incarnate grace of hospitality. So as you can tell, the book is like the DNA of Signpost End Ministries. It's basically Signpost End Ministries put into a book form. If you want to know what we're all about, if you want to know how we think, that's the reason for the book. So hit our website, signpostend.org, buy yourself a copy of the book. Um, and I will put this out there. The Probably the biggest selling point of the entire book is that it has Leaves Bread recipe in it. So if you've ever been to the <laughs> one of our Wednesday night, it, the events or to a, one of our retreats and had leaves uh, focaccia bread, the dipping bread that you dip in oil and uh, garlic. It's, it's delicious. She put the recipe in the book so you can have it. Make it yourself. It's pretty awesome. All right. That's my big update. Matt, wh what do you got? What's in your life uh, from the land of Boland? I mean, nothing as exciting as, as printing a book. <laughs> that's so, I mean, that's pretty awesome. I think the only thing that jumps to mind, and the reason it jumps to mind is because I'm sitting at my desk and I, I look out of this from this desk into our backyard through these windows. And I have a job of fixing some sprinkler heads that are in our yard that whenever, and we noticed it because last week we were sitting on our back porch while the sprinklers turned on. And all of a sudden we look over and one's just, just a geyser <laughs> just shooting straight up in the air. And so I was like, Okay, it's time. I, I, about once a year, I have to just take an afternoon to walk the yard and fix what's broken. But I had a sprinkler head. I okay. I I admit I broke my own sprinkler head. I was using my weed whacker and I cracked it open. And it's so easy to do. Yeah. And then I, I couldn't fix it. I tried. I went. Finally, found out that you have to. It's best to replace for your entire system to have all the same heads. Yep. And apparently there are some heads that work better with certain systems. And so it was the lowest head on my system and that like, like all the water drained to it. But mm -hmm. that just meant that it just like they, they would, it would sprinkle fine, then it would turn off and then it would just be this flood of water, just constant. It was a pain. Yep. yep. I, I don't know what it is. And this, this maybe should be its own episode at some point, but just how doing chores that revolve around homeownership 
seems to just expose the fear of utter incompetency and inadequacy because nothing quite triggers me as much as working on my yard and being like, I should be able to figure this out. And when I can't, it's like an existential crisis. Oh my gosh. I am so with you. Ah. <laughs> uh. We had, I had to do some plumbing and I, I, and we'll move on, but I had to do some plumbing lately. We mm -hmm. had to replace the guts of a toilet. We had to swap out a dishwasher. Um, and I had, and, and the, the plumbing that I had to do was that the, the inside the house spigots that connect to those appliances were so old and they didn't turn off. Right. So I had to yep. pull them off, cut the pipe and put a new one on. And like that, in terms of plumbing, that's one of the easiest jobs you can do. Except for when you're me. Right? Right? This is easy. I know the steps. It should have taken 30 minutes. And yet it's all day, three trips to Home Depot, and you have cussed in front of your family and <laughs> lost all respect. We didn't have a toilet for 24 hours because right? I had the wrong parts. Couldn't find the right parts. The place was closed. Oh, it was, yeah. Okay, we do need to have that podcast, but I really recommend we need to have beers present because there's oh, no way we can have that conversation without a little numbing agent or something. Yeah, this is the opportunity for a live show where listeners can share their s stories of their own home yep. improvement woes, and we can all just commiserate together Yep, and look to Jesus for our Amen. Uh, actually, that's not a bad segue, by the way, to our topic for today, <laughs> because, um, okay, so the article is by a guy named Henry Nouwen, um, and he is uh, a French-Canadian. The spelling of his name is a little funny. It's H-E-N-R-I-N-O-U-W-E-N, -E -E I believe. So it's like Henri Nouwen. Yeah. Pretty famous. A shout out to my aunt Alethea, by the way. She is a fan of Henry Nowen, and we've kind of geeked out a little bit together on his books. She sent me one of his books, oh, a while ago, one of one of his most famous books, and I didn't even know who he was. And it was a book that I took with me on my sabbatical retreat by myself and was life changing. So just aunt Alethea, if you're listening, thank you so much for the book and hope you love this episode. Um, So... Anyway, he's Henry Nouwen. Uh, he really pretty famous author in the spiritual practices world. I really like a lot of his stuff. He really has some really unique insights into it. Uh, so his his article, which I believe is just a transcript of a talk he gave, is begins with the idea of what discipline is, and he has a unique definition, I believe of spiritual disciplines and he's he, where this thing is going is he's going to be talking about ministry what allows us to actually minister to others and the reason i think listeners you're going to be interested in this is because ministry doesn't mean professional ministry it means serving others it means what we all do and so nowen's perspective is how do we get to the place where we can minister as Christians, as the body of Christ well. And he begins with a misconception because he says, we usually think that you go do ministry, right? You go serve people, you go work hard. And then because of that, you need to go back to your community and receive rest. And then you need sometimes to go spend Sabbath time in solitude so that you can be prepared to go back out into the ministry. Um, and so that is the normal way we think about it. The reason this is on my mind right now, the reason this article came up is because I've actually been doing a lot of work around uh, helping pastors and others take sabbaticals. I was able to be the sabbatical uh, spiritual director for a director at a church, youth director. She was able to take a month long sabbatical and I helped her plan it and walked with her through it. And it was really powerful in the middle of the process of helping my own pastor prepare for a sabbatical next year. It's just been on my mind a lot. One of the things that's becoming really clear to me 
is the reason we struggle with the idea of Sabbathing or resting or what now and is going to call solitude is because we have exactly like he said, we have it reversed. We think that we need to get out there and work hard first and earn it and then go back and be rejuvenated so we can go out and work again. And now and reverses that order. He actually looks at uh, Luke chapter six, verse 12, and he quotes it. And it's just now it happened in those days that Jesus went onto the mountain to pray and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And then the verse carries on. He comes back down the mountain and he calls to his disciples and they gather around him and then they go out and they start and he goes out. He begins to heal everybody who comes to him. And so in this verse, it's Luke 6, 12 through 14, I think. Now and sees the order being solitude and prayer leading to community, which then leads to ministry. And we're going to unpack that a little bit more, but that's the setup. Definitely. Well, and I mean, honestly, just the first page of this it has enough depth that we could talk about it for a while. I think right on the, he opens up talking about discipline and I don't know, and we've talked about this before. I don't know how many of our listeners have this same thing, but when I hear the word discipline, there's still a little small part of in the back of my mind that thinks of discipline as punishment, right? It yeah. discipline, and that's why I've always had this, this sense of failure or automatic, yeah, automatic failure towards the idea of spiritual disciplines. It's like, well, that that's a discipline. Um, it's hard. It's punishment. And so it. I've, I've always just wanted to retreat from that, um, mm -hmm. which is, which mm -hmm. is not the way scripture talks about it. Mm -hmm. Um, but in a fallen world, my concept of that has been, I, I recognize it now has been corrupted. So, mm -hmm. um, it's taken a lot of work and me and you have talked about this a lot privately. It's taken a lot of work for me to change my thinking on what spiritual disciplines actually means. Me too. Me too. And you know, it's interesting, Matt, I've, I've been doing a lot of re reading and research for theoretically an eventual new book um, that tackles the idea of spiritual spirituality and spiritual direction from, from my theological perspective, from a confessional Lutheran perspective. And so I've been doing a lot of reading on the history of spirituality and spiritual disciplines. And I think early on in the church, this confusion happened right away. Like the ascetic movement, kind of the proto monastic movement was born out of this idea that the world is corrupt. Uh, you know, Rome living in the city was corrupt, which amen, it was just like living in our modern age. There's a lot of debauchery and horrible stuff happening. And so they, they went away and disciplined themselves kind of following this idea of disciplining my body and Jesus talking about, you know, if your eye offends, pluck it out, so on. And the difference, so what they did though, was they missed the target. They aimed at the wrong thing. Let's put it that way. Because for them, and then consequently for much of the church throughout the early and middle ages, spiritual discipline was about ascending a ladder of virtue, killing off my sinful desires and becoming a detached, virtuous person who therefore could be given the vision of God, the, this, this kind of contemplative ascent. And I think the struggle we have, this is actually one of the big things I think the Reformation did for the church, was point out that the pursuit of virtue, that is like beating sin in my life, is a good thing, but it is not the primary thing. Mm -hmm. And I think the Reformation correctly like refocused our target, like re-aimed our, what we're going for now. And this is ironic because Henry Nouwen, by the way, is a Catholic. He's, he's a Catholic priest, um, but he gets it. 
like I think it's I think one of the things the Reformation did was show the church at large, Catholics and Protestants alike, that the monastic system and the ascetical virtue pursuit had become primary when it should be secondary. Yeah. Anyway, so all that to say, here's where we are now in the history of the church. Here's how Nowen defines spiritual discipline, which is a brilliant definition. Yeah. In the spiritual life, he says, the word discipline means the effort to create some space in which God can act. Discipline means to prevent everything in your life from being filled up. Discipline means that somewhere you're not occupied and certainly not preoccupied. In the spiritual life, discipline means to create that space in which something can happen that you hadn't planned or counted on. And I hope, you know, I hope you can catch, I hope listeners, you can catch that how different of an idea that is from going and punishing your body ascetically in order to somehow subdue your desires and become a spiritual superhero or a virtue superhero. It's related, and that's what I'm saying, is like it's connected, but I think what they're seeing, what, what now and appropriately captures in this quote and what we're going to develop in the discussion of this discipline of solitude is that that kind of thing, that kind of secondary order goal, which is becoming more virtuous, can only happen when I first give up myself to God entirely in faith. It's one of those ironic goals, right, of you can't get it if you directly pursue it. Because if you directly pursue it, you are breaking the first and most important command, which is love the Lord your God. That is let God be your God. And if you direct, you know, I'm going to pursue spiritual virtues. I'm going to pursue moral perfection directly so that I can see God and be a good man. You have become your own God and therefore you can't have any of the virtues because you break the first commandment. Well, and, and I love it's, it. It is such a subtle shift in perspective, but it's a world of difference because the idea of of spiritual disciplines or practicing spiritual disciplines has the brings in this idea of well, there's something I've got to do, I've got to do, 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 and this is much more a posture of receiving. Yes, which again, it's such a world of difference. But the idea of you know maybe maybe God is trying to do something in you, and maybe you just need to make some room for that to happen. Maybe it's not yeah. all on you to achieve something. It's more yeah. about receiving. Yeah. And it's so interesting that this discussion, I've had this discussion with a lot of people, young people, especially, you know, zealous young Christians struggle with flexibility in thinking. Let's put it that way. And they're, and they're typically looking for kind of keywords to pick out and, and nail, right? So if you say, look, it's not about doing something, it's about receiving, they're quick to point out, well, receiving is doing something. Amen, brother. Amen, sister. You know, and I, what I want to say is like, here's where flexibility comes in. Here's where like even experience, you have to bring your experience to bear on this. When Nowen says the spiritual discipline is the effort to create some space in which God can act. There's an irony here. Yes, receiving is a verb grammatically, right? It's a quote unquote doing grammatically, but it is not a doing when you, when you do the receiving, when you do the creating of space for God to act, the whole thing is what you're doing is not doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Like you, you, grammar betrays you at that point. You got to pay attention to what you actually, like you got to go to your experience and typically no offense to any young people listening, but typically I was 20 at one point in my life. Um, <laughs> typically, creating space for there to be nothing where, you know, where I'm not doing anything, but I'm waiting expectantly for God, patiently, openly, without effort and drive. Typically, when you're 20, you've never done that before. <laughs> 
Or if you have, it's been forced, you know, I'm bored. It's because the Wi-Fi was out and, and, and that's not a pleasant experience and you, and you've run from it as quickly as you can. And honestly, I think for most of us, I, I admit this to myself, I, I mm. still run from open space. I still run from ceasing from striving. I don't want to be alone with myself or my own voice. I don't want to be alone and create space for God to act because, well, two things. One, he might not, which would be terrible because that would scare me. What if I'm wrong? That's mm -hmm. the most common fear. But secretly, the bigger fear is what if he does? Mm -hmm. What if I make space for God and he comes and he says, okay, buddy, now we're going to start working on stuff. Mm. And that's even more terrifying than if he doesn't say anything. You're right. The fear is, is to let go of control yeah. for 15 to 30 minutes. And if you propose that to anybody in modern America right now, the answer is like, well, why should I? No. Why? Right. No. And, and also, even in, in the church, spiritually, when it comes to the spiritual disciplines, that is a thing where we still try to control that. Yes. I'm going to control my righteousness by exercising my spiritual disciplines, and I will earn favor from God. Yes. And, and, it, and it's, it's, it's miles away from receiving, and it is miles away from faith and just and trusting. Right. Because right. you're still in control. Right. Right, right, right. And, and so much of what passes for desiring for spiritual disciplines when people are, because it's a trendy topic right now. I mean, everybody's talking about it and it's becoming more, you know, it's, it's, got, it's having a re resurgence. It's sort of like bell bottoms, um, which I saw a girl wearing bell, bell bottoms yesterday. What the heck, man? Anyway, um, <laughs> and they were big too. They were not like, they, these were like 1970s full on. It was crazy. Oh, we are so um, Okay, because it's a fad, people are talking a lot about spiritual disciplines. In my experience is most people want me to give them a pretty serious workout, like tell them tell them to fast, tell them to, um, you know, read their entire Bible in an afternoon. I mean, like they really want, and and, and here's where Nowen's at. Nowen is says, look the spiritual discipline that he's talking about is the opposite of giving you a list of things to do. The first one is solitude. That is going away. Here, here's how he defines it. I'll just read it. Solitude is being with God and God alone. Like just, that's it. That's the definition. Like we can, we're all read some more in a minute. The first and most important spiritual discipline that moves into all the others, that is the foundation and root for all the others, is faith. Going to God and God alone. Being with God and God alone. That is ceasing from striving to find him. Ceasing from striving to be good enough for him. Ceasing from striving to establish my reputation as a good person. Ceasing from striving to read my Bible enough and pray enough or love my family enough, it's, it's setting aside every other single thing that would give me security or significance and receiving security and significance from God and God alone. That is faith. That's what it is. It, this is just faith. And solitude as a quote unquote practice can look a lot of different ways, but what it really is, however you end up doing it, it's just, you say, I say that I have faith and I trust God to give, to provide for all my needs. Solitude is the actual acting on that faith. I mean, I don't want to get too confusing here, but when James is talking about faith and works, this is kind of the idea he has in mind here. Works does not justify you. But if you say you trust that God provides everything you need, but you never set aside your pursuit 
of the things that give you a good reputation or set aside your pursuit of building your identity because you're a good person who prays the right ways, then do you really trust God to provide for all your needs? And and that's going to okay. condemn every last one of us. A, you know, like I am condemned right now, which is then what, uh, here's the way this works, which is then a, yep, I feel totally condemned and I, I am seen. No, I don't trust God enough. Which is then when the word says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just. Go confess. Just go be with him. Just go confess and find out that he loves you. And now do faith. And he's and you are forgiven and clean, and he does actually provide for all your needs. Go spend time with that. Yeah. Well, and, you know, while we're on the subject of being called out, right, um, Henry, uh, in, in right after the definition of what he calls solitude, solitude is being with God and God alone. And he immediately follows, up, follows that with a question. Is there any space for you to do that in your life? And there is nothing in modern life at all that prepares us for that. I mean, right. and if, if even if there happens to be a situation where I happen to be at home alone um, and, uh, and there's nothing necessarily pressing that I have to do, I'm still going to turn my phone on or I'm going to turn the radio on or I'm going to watch. Even if I'm not going to sit down and watch it, I'm going to throw the TV on because there is nothing in life that actually prepares you for solitude and, and, and sitting with God. Mm -hmm. It's, it's completely foreign mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm the worst about it. I'm horrible about it. I've got 30 mm -hmm. something projects that if I have mm -hmm. a spare moment, I'm like, oh, I can work on this now. And mm -hmm. God's never, frankly, on the list of things that I need to do. <laughs> yeah right yeah is there space for that in your life like you can play with that a little bit like one absolutely not there is no space because the world is crowding around me with noise and distraction 100% of the time and I am complicit I am pulling it upon myself I am wrapping myself in a blanket of distraction and noise and tasks constantly elsewhere i don't know who maybe this is just a quip from anonymous but um it has been said that prayer well and we'll just equate solitude with prayer for a moment is the art of stealing time <laughs> we have to steal the time from the world we have to steal the space from the world we have to steal it from the devil like we have to take it away from him you know the he the ruler of this world uh, owns the, the airwaves mm -hmm. and everything else and the distraction and we have to steal it sneak away with it and not get caught <laughs> yeah i love that actually um yeah. again this th this is immediately condemning Listeners, I want you to know, Matt and I are no better at this than you. I struggle so hard with my prayers, and I have my entire life. I am not this guy who gets up and spends 30 minutes with God every morning. I am, it, it, there's times in my life when I have, and there are times in my life when I have not. And most of my times have I have not. I, I am in the middle of right now working with God of learning how am I going to return to stealing enough time to actually do this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, we're walking with Henry now and through this article and he's talking to us about this. And it's almost like because the, the discussion about solitude and I think we all know what's on offer. What's on offer there is intimacy with God. And it's almost yeah. like, well, we should just cut the podcast right now. All of us, we've got our homework. Go try this out. Just let's see if any of us can get this. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about it because we, and I think we've all, at least God has in his mercy reached out and given us a taste of his presence and his spirit. And, and we know what's on offer. Um, it's just so easy to just like yeah. we've just said, get distracted or settle for yeah. lesser things. And so on a certain level, 
we almost have a hard time proceeding down in the article anymore because we're yeah. like, well, that's hard. And that's maybe why we get the order reversed so often, which yeah. is what you said right at the beginning is we reverse the order because the solitude part's the hard part. Yep. Hard. Yep. It's bizarrely hard because it's so easy. It, it requires nothing of us and we're terrified of something requiring nothing of us. <laughs> but I get it. Amen. Right. I, and I am too. And I don't do it. It's really hard. Um, however, the answer is in the solitude itself because I'm just going to continue on and then we are going to move on to the next part. He's, here's what Nowen says again. So solitude is being with God and God alone. Is there any space for that in your life? Why is it so important that you are with God and God alone on the mountaintop? It's, Im it's important because it's the place in which you can listen to the voice of the one who calls you the beloved. Mm -hmm. To pray, hear this, uh, please, I, I want to emphasize this. To pray is to listen to the one who calls you my beloved daughter, my beloved son, my beloved child. To pray is to let that voice speak to the center of your being, to your guts, mm -hmm. and let that voice resound in your whole being. Who am I? I am the beloved. That's the voice Jesus heard when he came out of the Jordan River. You are my beloved. On you, my favor rests. And Jesus says it to you and to me that we are loved as he is loved. Hmm. This is, okay, so it's bizarre that it is hard for me to take even five minutes to dwell on the word, capital T, capital W, Jesus, who says to me in every action and in every moment, as I am beloved by the Father, his favored child, you are, because through me you've been adopted. Yeah. And that's what we're invited to, is to simply dwell on his forgiveness and love. And receive mm -hmm. it with no strings attached, no requirement pre prerequisite done. Here's what solitude is. It is not a magical go spend two weeks alone in the woods, not in silent retreat. That may be what God is calling you to do. Fine, go do that. It may be spend 30 minutes in the morning in total silence, simply dwelling on the presence of God in these words. That's fine too. But it could also be five minutes over your lunch break. There's not a, there's not a magic art or, uh, you know, there's not a magical way to do this. It is making space and focusing on the word of God. You are loved because of Jesus. Yeah. And, you know, something as you were reading that section of the article jumped out to me. Lately, my thinking has been challenged on the idea of what is actually available to me as, as a Christian what Jesus experienced in his relationship with the Father. Because there's this sort of bias that says, well, obviously Jesus gets extra something because he is God and he dw he's dwelt with the Father for eternity. And therefore, there's some things that are just beyond that I'm never going to access. And my thinking recently has really been challenged on that idea of, well, is it? Is there anything in the gospel that Jesus experiences with the Father that is omitted from that, that I cannot access or that I'm denied because it kind of seems like the rest of the gospel is saying, this is Jesus walking out what faith on earth looks like for the believer. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's more available to me as a Christian than I've assumed I, ha I can access or I have, mm -hmm. I have the ability to enjoy. Amen. Um, as we move into ministry later, or maybe it's in community, I can't remember where it is, but I think it's in ministry. Nowen talks about the verse that like, you've seen me do great things. You, you'll do even greater things. You know, Jesus basically promises us that we're going to do greater things than even he, we saw him do. Well, what the heck does that mean? I'm not raising anybody from the dead. And the answer is au contraire. We're going to get there. You're, you're living focused on God's love for you. My living being fully focused on my identity being firmly rooted in the love of Jesus means that like Jesus, 
I spread the love of God and the resurrection of the spiritual resurrection to others simply by existing. I don't even have to think about it. That's where he's going. It's pretty brilliant, right? Like Jesus healed a woman who just touched the hem of his garment and he didn't, it, power flowed out from him. The same is going to happen for us. But we got to keep the order right, which is you don't need to think about doing that. Make space to hear the voice of God for you. Know God for you. And the mm. rest takes care of itself. Mm. Um, I just want to let, let's, let's kind of move to community. Here's, here's the bridge to community. He's still talking about spending time in solitude, right? Going and listening to the voice of God. So who am I? I'm the beloved, right? That's the voice that, that Jesus that, that Jesus heard and that he now gives to me. Now it says, there are many other voices speaking loudly. And this is that distraction piece. Many other voices in the world saying, prove that you're the beloved, prove that you're mm -hmm. worth something, prove that you have a contribution to make, do something relevant. Be sure you make a name for yourself, at least have some power. Then people will love you. Then people will say you're wonderful. Then you'll be great. These voices are strong in this world. These were the voices Jesus heard right after he heard, you are my beloved. Another voice said, prove that you are the beloved. Do something. Change these stones into bread. Be sure that you're famous. Jump from the temple and, be, and you will be known. Grab some power. Jesus said, no, I don't have to prove anything. I'm already the beloved. And that is the practice of salt. You want to know what the practice of faith is it's the reliving Jesus's temptation in the desert. No, I don't have to prove anything to you, to myself or to Satan. Hmm. I'm already the, the favored child of God because of Jesus. He goes on. If you keep that in mind, and I would just add, if you, if, if I can learn to live in that space, then you then he now it says you can deal with enormous amounts of success as well as enormous amounts of failure without losing your identity because your identity is that you are the beloved that's where ministry starts continuing on still quoting because your freedom is anchored in claiming your belovedness that allows you to go to this world and touch people to heal them, to speak with them. It's an incredible mystery of God's love that the more you know how deeply you are loved, the more you will see how deeply your sisters and brothers in the human family are loved. So he really spends, we, there's more to read here, but he spends a ton of time on this importance of this, but I think we've kind of hit it. This is the hub of the wheel, as he says. To return to this center that I am the beloved, to dwell there, to grow there, to that, to, if you're going to focus on anything, focus on that. Don't focus on serving others. Don't focus on building a better community. Focus on you yourself, knowing your belovedness and growing that in you, letting God grow that in you. And like a hub on a wheel, that center will, will hold together all the other things safely. Community then flows from this place. Again, here's, here's Nowen. He says, it's remarkable that solitude always calls us to community. In solitude, you realize you're, you're part of a human family and that you want to lift some, lift something together by community. I don't mean formal communities. I mean, families, friends, parishes, 12 step pro uh, programs, prayer groups. Community is not an organization. Community is a way of living. You gather around, uh, you gather around yourself, people with whom you want to proclaim the truth that we are the beloved sons and daughters of God. So just like with solitude, I want to point out that he's, he's really radically changed the definition of community from what we commonly think of community being. Um, 
we sort of think of community, I think, most of the time in our modern context as being an institutional kind of thing. Uh, and it's, we go there and serve people. But what he's talking about is this, the kind of community that grows organically out of people knowing that they're beloved in solitude with God and God alone and finding those kindred spirits and sharing that in common. Like what, what pulls the community together is not that we create a small group or we create a program. Not that those are bad. It's just that what pulls people together in real community is I found somebody else that really knows that they're beloved and together we're like, oh man, isn't this cool? And we, we share this common interest together, this common love together. And that makes us want to pull more people in. We're like, you need to know you're beloved too. Come mm -hmm. hang out with us. Well, and I can't help but think of C.S. Lewis's famous quote about, about the spark of friendship being that moment when you look at somebody else and say, wait, what? You too? Yes. You've experienced this too. You see what I see. You love what I love. Yes. And interestingly, communion with God is the spark of friendship that you can have with literally any other person, no matter how different you are. Yes. Yes. It literally makes universal community, universal unity possible. Yes. Yes. Right. Because my primary identity, think again, hub and spokes. Um, in my first book, uh, Changing the Conversation, I talk about this in terms of a solar system and, and, and orbits. Identity is like a solar system. What is at the center that, that all the other, you know, all the labels, all the descriptors I can say about myself that give me my identity, um, are naturally going to orbit around something that's the center. And now you can move different things and try to put them in the center, but they don't have enough gravity to hold it. So only the sun has enough weight and mass to be the, a safe center of, of an identity. A descriptor of me is my nationality, my gender, my um, interests, my whatever. All those things. Amen. My personality type. Okay, great. Those are all part of my identity. But if I take any one of those and I put them at the center as if it's the sun, it's too light. It doesn't have enough weight to hold me together and I disintegrate. Mm -hmm. If... I am the beloved son of the creator of the universe. I am the beloved daughter of the creator of the universe. Jesus has promised to me and made certain to me that I am adopted and cannot be rejected. I am safe and secure. I am significant. Then all those other relevant descriptors that we just named matter, but they're not the center anymore. I don't have to fight to defend them. I don't have to s force you to recognize them because I don't need anybody else's recognition. I don't need anybody else's validation. I, my center is God, the creator of the entire universe loves me. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that then transcends all boundaries and makes community possible. As you said, with everyone, because I come up against another solar system and I go, Ooh, what are you, what are you interested in? Well, I'm interested in, you know, fishing. Well, I could care less about fishing, but Jesus loves, me. oh, you like that? All right. We're good. We're buddies. You know what I mean? Like, and, and I can, I can now be interested in your, your interest of fishing and not feel threatened that I'm not interested in it because it doesn't matter. Right. And that, and that's, and that's another interesting thing about that is that it doesn't, whenever you enter a community like this, you don't need to require or force anybody else to look like you or right. to have the same experience you do again because you're already you're already secure in right. your identity and you can engage and receive with curiosity uh any anybody who enters into that circle you don't have to control their spiritual life which unfortunately right. is a, a, t a temptation in some right. Christian circles right Right. Well, let's imagine that we could have a ideal community, 
a church, let's say, that had an organic community based around a bunch of believers who were practicing this solitude, this faith that we've been talking about, who are really on a regular basis reminding themselves and dwelling in the love of Jesus for them individually. Let's imagine that that existed. It doesn't. And I, listeners, I recognize no church has this. So mm -hmm. I'm not, we are not Pollyanna telling you that somehow this can happen in the world. Actually, it can get better, but, but let's imagine that that community existed. It, that community and people in that community wouldn't even be threatened by people who are, who have placed wrong things at the center of their mm -hmm. identity. It wouldn't even be threatened by people who have placed sinful things as their central identity because they can't be, th I can't be threatened when Jesus is the sun in the center of my universe, constantly radiating to me. I love you. You're safe. You're significant. You don't need those people's respect. I have given you everything you need. When I, if that were, if I could ever be in that place and I will be after the resurrection, but if I could be more in that place now, I'm not even threatened when someone walks into my community or through my church doors or into my life who has got a really bad thing at the center of their identity. Instead, and this is the next step, this leads to ministry. Instead, I look at that person with compassion and say, oh, buddy, I really hope you can get Jesus as the center and take that out of the center because, man, you're going to be so much happier. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and maybe this is an assumption on my part, but I think David Zoll is going to be listening to this right now saying, like, exactly. I talked about all right. this in local anthropology. <laughs> right. Yeah, like, you're right. He's going to be like, you should just read my book. Yeah. Uh, fair enough. David, if you're listening, uh, give us a Facebook shout out. Cause yeah. Um, <laughs> or we'll just link to all those, the, the episodes where you interviewed him. Um, yeah. The, all right. 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 <laughs> this, this whole podcast is a go back and listen to another podcast. All right. So, so let's, let's, let's push on. Um, he has some really great stuff to say about the discipline, again, remember, discipline is not active effort, but making space for the disciplines that, that develop in community, right? This community that grows out of this organic, we are beloved children of God. Um, he does say, right, right off the bat, community is not easy. Somebody once said, I'm still quoting, community is the place where the person you least want to live with always lives. And the answer is you don't need to seek that out. You don't have to go find a community where there's people you don't like. If you begin to live with other human beings in this, like, we are beloved children of God way, then your sin will be known. <laughs> and their sin will be known. Because if you're, if you're together, like, if you're together receiving from God his love for you, then what happens is, you're allowed, you're allowed to be vulnerable, which means people will see your sin mm -hmm. and you will see other people's sins, which means that the person you hate the most will suddenly be there because you're gonna be like, oh crud, he's got some serious flaws. Um, however, that opens the door in now one's way of thinking for the disciplines of forgiveness and celebration. And what I love about his understanding of forgiveness is it's so similar to his understanding of solitude. Um, here's his definition. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness is to allow the other person not to be God. Hmm. Wait, unpack that for me. He says, forgiveness hmm, is to allow the other person not to be God. Forgiveness says, I know you love me but you don't have to love me unconditionally because no human being can do that. Just reading on, we all have wounds. We are all in so much pain. It is precisely this feeling of loneliness that lurks behind all of our successes, the feelings of uselessness that hides under all the praise, the feeling of meaninglessness, even when people say we are fantastic. That is what makes us sometimes grab on to people and expect from them an affection and love they cannot give. 
So what he sees is that in community, we demand that everyone around us be perfect because we feel our insufficiency. We demand that our pastor be perfect at preaching and totally compassionate and always wise. We command that our wives be completely and always uh, uh, loving and kind and forgiving and sh always praising and never have a bad day because I can't handle it if she doesn't like me today because I'll fall apart. My wife cannot do that. She's not God. Right. We yeah. expect our husbands to be perfectly strong and stable and never have a bad day and never do anything wrong. And I can't do that. We expect our friends to always be available to us and to never talk about us badly and to never make us feel bad and to always know our needs and not be, have to be told. Our friends can't do that. So they're going to hurt us. They're going to sin against us. And forgiveness then is allowing that. Like the compassion is that it's, oh, you're a sinner like me. Remember that the only way we can do that is because the only place, um, the energy for forgiveness can only come from solitude with God and God alone. Yep. Because there I have my needs met unconditionally every time. There I know that I am safe, secure, and not alone every time, unconditionally, without fail. And so I can release you of the burden of having to do that for me because God is doing it. Yeah, I get the, 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 the phrase that comes to mind and let me know if, if this would, um, makes any sense, but it's almost like a pre-approved grace. Like you get those things <laughs> of, it's like, you're already approved for this much credit. Right. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, that's what, that's what, that's what Christian community is. Like you've already got an abundant amount of grace already stored up for the people you're in, you're doing life with. Mm-hmm. And again, and again, remember that this is like, this is sort of like talking about the ideal. I am not this, I am not forgiving like this. I, I, I hold on to grudges. I get mad. I can't, I, I cannot well up within me the virtue of forgiveness by sheer force of will. And if your church is anything like mine, there's really angry, unforgiving, broken relationships kind of everywhere, kind of everywhere. Look, if your church is like mine, there are people you don't talk to on Sunday morning because you can't handle them. Hmm. So we're not saying that this is the magic fix that suddenly you can have a community where there's never any wounds or hurts. Notice that forgiveness is exactly the opposite. It's recognizing that's not possible in this world. Which drives me back to prayer. Lord, you are my God. You are my place of, of safety. I trust in you and you alone. I look to you and you alone. Lord, help me in my unbelief. Lord, help me in my unforgiveness. Right? I mean, we're not saying that we've got the magic cure. We're saying there isn't one. So we return to God and God alone. And ironically, I think that by doing that, the healing that we want to be complete and 100% can begin. We can have more of it in this world, even if we can't have all of it. Yeah. Ministry is the final step. So we've gone through solitude, which as we together revel and rest in our belovedness that draws us together. And then we get to practice forgiveness in community and celebration, celebrating each other for who they are in that community. Um, you can read the article if you want to know, I talk about celebration. It's quite interesting. But then here's where ministry comes from. Now and says all the disciples of Jesus are called to ministry. Ministry is not, first of all, something that you do. Notice the theme. 
<laughs> right? He's doing it with every one of these. Ministry is not something that you do, although it calls you to do many things. But first of all, ministry is something that you have to trust. Mm. If you know you are the beloved, and if you keep forgiving those with whom you form community and celebrate their gifts, you cannot do other than minister. Jesus cured people not by doing all sorts of complicated things. No, a power went out from him and everyone was cured. He didn't say, let me talk to you for 10 minutes and maybe I can do something about this. Everyone who touched him was cured because a power went out from his pure heart. He wanted one thing, to do the will of God. He was completely the completely obedient one, the one who was always listening to God. Out of this listening came an intimacy with God that radiated out to everyone Jesus saw and touched. Ministry means that you have to trust that. You have to trust that if you are the son and daughter of God, power will go out from you and people will be healed. So, to summarize, there's one discipline, trust. That's it. That's the whole truth. Trust. You practice that in solitude. That leads to community. And then it's also, it is act, doing that one thing, continually relying on God and God alone, that actually does do ministry by doing that one thing. Or, or rather, by not doing anything but letting God be your God, ministry happens. I think we all know this in our experience. Mm -hmm. Who in your church do you actually go to? Who in your church is a safe haven or solace for you? Everybody knows somebody in their community, whether it's church or otherwise, that you just like that, you know that that person more often than not is going to be a safe place for you, a good place for you, an encouraging place for you. And I bet if you were to ask them why they were that way, it has more to do with the fact that they are not thinking about being that, but they are more in touch with God doing it for them. And so they just sort of, you know, in our new book, we talk about this in terms of oases in the desert. That we arrive at an oasis where Jesus is. And that's usually in another person's hospitality. But from that oasis, we then become an oasis for others. Mm -hmm. Well, again, the thing that now on is, is shifting there for us is this idea, and, and you, you said it at the very beginning, that we think ministry is about doing things for others. And sure, that sure. happens. That's sure. But, but mm -hmm. after we've really had intimacy with the father, what we come to realize is that what this person standing in front of me really needs is to be connected with the father, to be reminded yes. of their true right. identity. And that's what they really need. Like, yes, this person that has come to me at church might need advice about a relationship, but what they really need is to be reminded and reconnected with the father. That's what they mm -hmm. really need. Mm -hmm. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not a, oh, I need to help this widow in the church move a couch. Mm -hmm. Sure. That needs to happen. We can do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what she really needs is the ministry of mm -hmm. connection with God. Mm -hmm. And, and to address, address those young folks again, again, young people, if you're listening, please don't be offended that I'm <laughs> using you as an example. But I, I would want to encourage the young and the vigorous and those who are desirous of making a difference in the world. Amen. Please don't lose that. However, notice, please notice that ministry, helping the, the lady move her couch, feeding the poor, solving an injustice, you will know best which of those actions to engage and how to direct your, your energy when you yourself have let go of the control of having to figure it out. Yep. In other words, when you 
are turning all things over, this world, yourself, and everything, to the love of God who secures you and holds you. You are already his beloved, and you are focusing your energies on dwelling there. Then you will see with clarity where to direct that doing energy. And the mistake that all of us make, that I still make, mm -hmm. is I'm trying, well, I'm going to direct my energy towards this ministry or this cause or this issue, and I'm going to do it hard. We're going to get this done. Amen. But I can tell you from my own experience, nine times out of 10, that's driven by my desire for significance, my desire for recognition, my desire for securing myself in your eyes, whatever else. And then it's not ministry. It's dominance. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's really profound stuff. Yeah. It, okay. It's a great article, as you can tell. There's much more to talk about. Uh, listeners, uh, I will, we'll make sure there's a link to a copy of the article in the show notes. Please go take It's actually quite short. Um, it's maybe five or six pages at the most. Um, great. Great little thing. Great piece to read. Uh, and I hope you've enjoyed our discussion of it. So, mm -hmm. Any closing thoughts, Matt? Many, but I don't, none of them are fully formed yet. So I'm just going to keep chewing on this all day. Um, may, maybe when we actually post this, uh, this podcast up on the website, I'll listen to it with a fresh mind and then we can come back and talk about it again. Uh, there you go. Maybe by that time I'll, <laughs> I'll have some, uh, I'll have something more to say about it, but it, it's just, uh, I love Henry now and everything I've ever read by him has been so insightful and so profound. So, uh, yeah. listeners, you, you can't go wrong. If you're, if you're looking for some, something like that, definitely, uh, check out this article, check out, uh, prodigal, uh, return of the prodigal son. Yep. Is that the, that's the one book that's that the, we talked about. Yeah. That's the book my aunt Alethe gave me and perhaps one of his most famous and it's yeah. phenomenal and it's about it's this really issue good. about being the beloved so yeah so good yeah the return of the prodigal son yeah all right thank you matt it's good to see you and be with you today listeners thank you for being with us we we appreciate you and we pray for you before we start every episode um and, and we will be praying for you after this episode that that you will hear the voice of god calling you the beloved and that you will take the invitation to go spend time with that voice and to let it sink into your guts. Mm -hmm. So may the grace of Christ go with you wherever the road takes you. Amen. Thanks for listening. This podcast is a production of Signpost In, a nonprofit Christian ministry dedicated to helping people connect with God and find direction. We offer spiritual direction, retreats, and lots of other resources like this podcast. Please visit us at signpostin.org to learn more. We especially want to thank our generous donors who support our work and keep this podcast going. If you've benefited from something you've heard on this show, please consider supporting us by making a tax-deductible gift at signpostin.org donate. That's signpostin.org donate. And thank you. Thank you.